Let me turn the music down. Hello there everyone, it is Christy. Welcome back to the book club. As you can see, we're going to be continuing on with The Social Construction of Reality by Berger and Luckman. Now, uh, what I just want to lay out a little bit about how far I got in this. So for those of you who have read ahead, we might not, uh, we might not cover everything that you've covered so far in the chapter, but uh, we looked already at chapter one, which is sort of setting up the, uh, let's say the a priori or, um, things that we're going to assume about the way human beings act and interact and our communication, the way language uh, frames the way that we experience uh, the world and shapes the way we can express those kinds of things and how we need other people, all that kind of stuff. Now they're going to talk a little bit more about the social construction of reality. And I don't know about you guys, um, I really found this chapter quite exciting and interesting. And I only read up to the part before we talk about institutionalization or institutionalism. I'm not quite sure. I don't remember precisely what they said. But let's go ahead and get into it. So we're going to, um, let's see, dip in here and see exactly where it's going to pop me up. Ah, oh, all right. It's going to take me to the section at the very beginning because I was looking up the author's names. So let's go to um, the social construction of reality. And is there another subset? Cool. Part two, society is objective reality. This is what we're going to be looking at. Oh, that's a bit too big. Is that too big? Yeah, it's too big uh, for my screen anyway, because there we go. I think that's better. Let me uh, increase the size of the font because I know for those of you, let's say on on mobile phones, it might be more difficult to read font that seems perfectly fine on a desktop. All right, so uh, I want to go through, I've highlighted certain sections of this that I want to pull out, and these can also form the basis of a discussion later on when we have the book club again. And really quickly, apologies for delaying this on the Sunday and also on yesterday. Uh, I'm kind of juggling a lot of things between coming back to work full time, where I, I try not to apologize a lot, so apologies for the apology, but I'm, I'm writing for work, which is also very which is always more intellectually demanding uh, because it's not just about writing. You have to think about how you're going to write and what you're going to write and all that kind of structure it and, and, and revise it and rethink it. It's quite intellectually draining. And then I'm also uh, committed to some D&D games, which I've been preparing for um, and I'm DMing for the first time. So I'm sort of really taking those responsibilities seriously, which means I'm doing a lot of intake with new information on Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, as a consequence, I kind of just mentally was burned out. I didn't feel like I was in a place to properly engage with this content. And this content is very, very interesting to me and very exciting. It's, it's, um, it's interesting going back now and reading this book and seeing how much actually I have retained the worldview that the authors lay out here without actually consciously remembering that they were possibly the source of this. A lot of times when I talk about my influence, especially on epistemology and things, I mention Kant um, or I mention other thinkers, but really I'm, I'm seeing a lot of my epistemological perspective um, in these pages. And so that's been really uh, exciting because it's, it's good to give the people who do the work the credit that they're due. I think I'm going to just try to, yeah, I realized my lighting here is a little bit weird. So as a consequence, I'm going to just, uh, let me just do a real professional job here of adjusting my lighting and be able to see me without quite so much shine, I think. Uh, it's a very, very ex um, elaborate and uh, professional setup I've got going. It's basically a, a, a scarf thingy that I've got uh, tied up to my shade and then uh, a clothespin. Isn't that Look behind the curtain. All right, I managed to waste, what, like five minutes? All right, let's get into it. Part two of uh, the social construction of reality starts to lay out the process by which humans perceive their social situations and the social realities in which they find themselves as objective reality. And as always, one of my complaints with Berger and Luckman is that you have to kind of read everything they write to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. And I think I've said before that I am a very obvious writer. Uh, I figure people are busy and they don't have time always to like sort of like try to figure out what's in my head and what's important. So as a consequence, um, let's see, do I have a, ah, yes, there are highlights here. Um, so as a consequence, I, I try to provide that structure to you 
even though it doesn't, it kind of exists in the book, but it's not laid out, it's not made explicit. And here, there are some really interesting points that they are going to try to get across about the way in which human beings, and they say man all the time, it's really sexist language, it might also be a consequence of the German, um, but it's always framed in terms of man and man's environment and sick man, you know, like, not sick as in it's S-I-C-K, as in S-I-C, as in it's it's in, um, and it's an erroneous way to refer to all human beings. But anyway, they got some pretty woke stuff later on, which I think they don't know how woke they were back in the day. But anyway, um, <laughs> focus, Christy, focus. So the purpose of this chapter is to start to make the case that human beings occupy a very special place in the animal kingdom, that we have a very unique uh, sort of comportment to our environment uh, the way that we relate to our environment is quite unique as a species, and that um, we, unlike a lot of other animal species, have an amount of sort of self-determinism to shape our environment, and yet we are born into an already culturally and socially situated, determined location in any society. And there is a tension there between our ability to make our environment our social environment, but also the fact that we are oftentimes constrained and determined initially, at least, growing up by our environments. All right, that's kind of the, I think, where they're going with this chapter, at least that's my take on it. So I'm going to pull out a few sections from the chapter, lines that I've highlighted, and bring those out and explain why I think they're important. So as they say here, organism and activity, man, occupies a peculiar position in the animal kingdom, Unlike other higher mammals, he has, or she has, or they have, no species-specific environment. No environment structured by his own instinctual organization. There's no man-made world in the sense that one may speak of a dog world or a horse world. Right, so this is talking, basically laying out their premise that human beings' relationship to our environment is actually characterized by this phrase they use called world openness, that our relationship to our surrounding environment is everywhere very imperfectly structured by our biological constitutions. Um, so I think one of the things, you know, they say um, humans are permitted to engage in different activities, but the fact that we can live a nomadic existence in one place and turn to agriculture cannot be explained in terms of our biological processes. If we think about birds, I'm not, okay, I'm not a biologist, so I'll stand corrected if this is wrong. But when it comes to birds' instincts, either to migrate or to build nests, uh, they're you know like a, a a male bird will build a nest in order to attract a mate, and that is not something that we have an equivalent for. I mean, we have aspirations for those kinds of things, but we aren't driven entirely by an instinctual drive to um, operate within a certain way within our environment. We have the possibility of um, being much more open to the way that we experience and live our lives. So I think, um, as they say, you know, humans do have drives, of course, but these drives are highly unspecialized and undirected. And that allows us a kind of flexibility that is unlike anything else found anywhere on Earth or anywhere else in the universe, as far as we know. Right. So as I have a little pull quote or a highlight here, the human organism is capable of applying its constitutionally given equipment to a very wide um, and, in addition, constantly variable and varying range of activities. How we live our lives has a greater amount of freedom. We are not biologically, as I said, pushed to migrate every season. Um, or pushed to make nests uh, for every every spring. We have um, a, a kind of a choice and a flexibility. We have drives, but how we express those drives isn't biologically predetermined. And this is important. The developing human being not only interrelates with a particular natural environment, but with a specific culture and social order. So even though we exist within a biological, um, you know, uh, sorry, within a in a biological, an ecological system, and we have all of these, you know, sort of things that um, we experience in terms of our environment, we also interact with a cultural 
order and a social order on top of that. We're not the only animals that do that. Obviously, there's a lot of social um, social animals, pack animals that have kinds of specific social and cultural orders, but the way that human beings do, it has a, such a variety and a flexibility that it cannot be explained by uh, an appeal to biological drives. That's where I think that they kind of go in this chapter. All right, so the developing human not only interrelates with a particular natural environment, but with a specific cultural and social order, which is mediated to him, her, or them, them by the significant others who have charge of them. The direction of an organ, organism's development is socially determined, not purely biologically determined. From the moment of birth, human's development is indeed a large part of his or her or their biological being as such, uh, um, and as such are subjected to continually socially determined inferences. Inferences, yes. There's a lot here to unpack. I'm not sure I always understand 100% what they're getting at, so I don't want to feel, I want you to feel, I don't want you to feel my interpretation is definitive, but this is what my understanding of what they're trying to get at is, um, is that uh, there's socially determined influences on top of uh, the, the biological situations in which we find ourselves. So the ways of, this is interesting too, might be part of the German influence here. The ways of becoming and being human are as numerous as human cultures or as man's cultures. Humanness is a socio-cultural variable. In other words, there is no human nature in the sense of a biologically fixed substratum determining the variability of sociocultural formations. There is only human nature in the sense of anthropological constants. Now, what they are saying, and so just to restate this, is that our biology does not determine our culture. Um, that there's just too much variation in the way human societies have been organized to make an appeal to genes or to hormones, or to brain structure, or any of the other kind of, you know, um, turfy, <laughs> I'm going to be honest, uh, turfy perspectives on biological essentialism. And it's interesting later on because they bring up sex and sexuality as a, as a prime, as the example they choose uh, to illustrate the flexibility in human nature. So the specific shape into which this humanness is molded is determined by those sociocultural formations and is relative to their numerous variations. While it is possible to say that man or humans have a nature, what is more significant to say, um, it, it is more significant to say that man constructs his own nature, or more simply, that humans produce themselves. As you can see, I'm not using the actual text because it's so gendered. Um, but this is, I think, a really powerful counterpoint to, again, a sort of essentialist view of the world that's often used to, to support something like a difference feminism that points to, um, you know, relatively superficial differences in mass, muscle mass, height, and bone density. Um, when you look at all the ways in which uh, cis people, uh, trans people are completely identical, blood type, we can transplant organs, we can transplant eyes, our ears work the same. Most of our bodies are actually carbon copies with a little bit of variation. Um, and where was I going with this? Uh, and, and, but, the, but the differences that we point to are generally more social than physical. The kinds of things that people point to to show that there are these essential biological differences, say, between cis men and cis women, um, are really a result of social roles, of what it means to be a mother um, in, certain, in a Western society or a father. The notion of provider um, and tied to maybe biblical notions of power and authority and taking um, those kind of cultural um, norms of authority, punishment, justice, you know, um, rule and order and putting those with the masculine and taking nurturing and comfort and selflessness and self-negation uh, and subservience and associating it with the feminine, those aren't biologically driven. Those are socio 
um, factors or socio social social norms. This is what happens when you just riff off a you don't prepare a script you just riff. Okay, so humans produce themselves, and that's a simple sentence, but I think we could actually spend quite a lot of time just thinking about the implications of that. While it is possible to say that humans have a human nature, it is more significant to say that humans construct their own natures, or more simply, that humans produce themselves. Um, and yeah, <laughs> for all the trouble it is to wade through this book, it, that this is the kind of stuff that makes it worth it for me. So again, they use this, uh, this is the example of human sexuality. Human sexuality is characterized by a very high degree of pliability. It is not only relatively independent of temporal rhythms, that is to say, I mean, outside women, um, sorry, uh, uh, outside those who have periods, right? I'm trying to get away from my, my bifurcated view of the world. So it's a practice uh, until I get it perfect. Uh, for those who have periods, there might be some sort of cyclical nature to it, uh, but some people's hormones don't work that way, so it's not like tied to the moon cycles or changes or whatever. Um, but other than that, like human beings have sex all the time. No one has to wait for someone to go into heat for human beings to have sex. We'll just do it whenever. Um, and all kinds of things turn people on and people find all kinds of things attractive and there's a massive amount of variation. So as I say here, human sexuality is characterized by a very high degree of pliability. It is not only relatively independent of temporal rhythms, it is pliable both in the objects toward which it may be directed and in its modalities of expression. Ethnological evidence shows that in sexual matters, humans are capable of almost anything. Right? That it, so this shows in the ways the ways in which we, although bound in a biological being, we are not our sexuality is certainly not biologically determined. All right. If the tor term if the term normality is to refer to either what is anthropologically fundamental or to what is culturally universal, then neither it nor its antonym can be meaningfully applied to the varying forms of human sexuality. At the same time, of course, human sexuality is directed, sometimes rigidly structured, in every particular culture. Every culture has a distinctive sexual configuration with its own specialized patterns of sexual conduct, conduct and its own anthropological assumptions in the sexual area. The empirical relativity of these configurations, their immense variety, and luxuriousness invented <laughs> sorry, luxurious inventiveness. <laughs> you kind of get I'm I, okay. I'm not gonna just I'm not like I, I don't I don't know if this is the case or not. I'm just kind of thinking maybe some of these people were into kink like before it was cool, like before it was more mainstream because <laughs> they seem totally cool and open and like I love the idea of luxuriousness. Sorry, luxuriousness, luxurious inventiveness. Like that's a really nice way to talk about it indicate that they are the product of humans' own socio-cultural formations rather than of a biologically fixed human nature. Um, again, I, this might be something we can talk about a bit more in the book group discussion whenever that happens, but I, I think this is, um, they make a pretty compelling argument based on observations. All right, so moving on. The formation of the self, then, must also be understood in relation to both the ongoing organism's development and the social process in which the natural and the human environment are mediated through the significant others. Our formation of who we are has some degree of autonomy, but it also it cannot be understood outside the context of the natural environment, but also the human environment, and the role that others who mediate our understanding um, and teach us how to be part of that society play. Okay. Next thing I've pulled out from this chapter, it goes without saying then that organism and even more the self cannot be adequately understood apart from the social, the particular social context in which they were shaped. 
And on the one hand, and okay, okay, so basically this is just talking about the interdependent relationship between humans, human ex- human experience, human um, self-awareness and self-determination, and the role that our society plays in terms of uh, the values it gives us, the constraints it gives us, and, and how we can operate within it. Uh, it's basically social psychology, if we want to think about it in that way. I think. That's my take. We're going to move on to a, uh, a different part of the chapter where they talk about the uniqueness of human beings in terms of how we regard ourselves. And uh, as far as we know, because other animals can't express themselves, but uh, if, as far as we know, this is a, a pretty unique perspective. And I would tend to agree with this after you know, reflection. Uh, on the one hand, humans or a person is a body in the same way that this may be said of every animal organism. On the other hand, a person has a body. That is, humans experience themselves as an entity, and that is not identical with their body, but on the contrary, has a body at its disposable, as its disposal. In other words, humans' experience of themselves always hovers in a balance between being and having a body, a balance that must be redressed again and again. I didn't highlight that part, but I probably should have. I don't know why I didn't. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a really, I don't know if this is an original insight, but I think it's a very profound one that we teeter constantly on the, um, or we even sometimes manage to exist both as a being and as a being in a body. I think we are probably, I am personally most aware of my body when I'm in pain. If I am not in pain, I don't tend to think about my body other than its usefulness in moving my conscious brain around the world. I don't really think about walking when I walk. I don't think about, you know, like using my back muscles to type. I am mostly focused on the moment of my consciousness and like right now. Uh, I'm not thinking so much about the fact that I'm sitting cross-legged other than after, say, an hour when my knee starts to ache. So I am both a being and I am a being in a body. And we are constantly, as they say here, they are arguing, um, hovering or moving between these two states. This eccentricity of humans, I'm just, I can't do the mans. I just can't. Like, whenever I see this in the text, I just skip over it. And when I read it out loud, I have to update it for a modern audience. So it's easier for me to, in, to instead of going, this eccentricity of man's sick, you know, S-I-C, as in this is a wrong way of saying it. This is a, tech, a, a grammatical error. Um, I'm just adapting the language to be more inclusive. So if you don't, nobody who's going to watch this is going to have a problem with that, I don't think. This eccentricity of human experience of their own bodies has certain consequences for the analysis of human activity as a conduct in the material environment and as an externalization of subjective meanings. Human self-production is always and of necessity a social enterprise. There's no point in producing a self um, and, you know, if you don't have anyone else who cares or you don't have any cultural constraints or you have no society in which you live in, if we all individually had um, islands that we lived on that had enough, I don't know, coconuts or whatever else and bugs or whatever to keep us fed, there would be no need for us to do really anything in terms, we could just be whatever we wanted, do whatever we wanted because we would be on our own. But when it comes to actually producing a self that exists in a society, it, that always happens in the mirror of other people. Humans together produce a human environment. And I don't know here that they just talk, yeah, yeah. And I don't think here they're just talking about a physical human environment. They're also talking about the kind of societies that we live in and the freedoms that we might enjoy or be denied, the things to which we have access or not. So humans together produce a human environment with the totality of its socio-cultural and psychological formations. None of these formations may be understood as products of man's or human's biological constitution. None of none of the things that happen in our society are the result are biologically determined. They are all con- they are mediated through consciousness. Human society, human the human environment that we live in is a result of our um, conscious minds, 
not our biological determinations. Which, as indicated, provides only the outer limits. This is the biological constitution. Our biology provides only the outer limits for human productive activity. It's kind of a dense chapter, but it's got some really good stuff in it. As soon as one observes phenomena that are specifically human, one enters the realm of the social. Humans' specific humanity and so sociality are inextricably intertwined. This is a really cool line. Homo sapiens is always, and in the same measure, homo socius. Um, so, yeah, just let, kind of let that sit there. Uh, to be human means to be a social being in a, so, in a social creature, in some sense or the other. Empirically, human existence takes place in a context of order, direction, and stability. From, wha from what does the empirically existing stability of human order derive? They say the answer may be given on two levels. The first is that a given social order precedes any individual organs, organism's development. We are born into pre-existing societies. I didn't have a choice about the way that white supremacy is pervasive in the economic factors, structures, justice system, um, uh, political system in, in America. I, I, was, I was born into a, pre, a society that was predetermined for me, right? Um, do, 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 do. And then, if only like, they say this like the first, um, if one way first point to the obvious fa fact, and then they go on and on. And I don't know if they ever kind of get to the second. I was trying to find this <laughs> where their second one, but I guess it must be the question may, they, may then be pushed. This is the second factor. In what manner does social order itself arise? How do how did I get to how do we get to the place where um, kids are being born today into a, a society that is still um, pervasive, where, where white supremacy and white power. Um, it disproportionate and at the expense of others is still being preserved and maintained over time in America. So the most general answer to this question is that social order is a human product, or more precisely, and I think this is right, it's an ongoing human production. Our social reality is something that we participate in in order to make it real. If human beings stopped participating in certain activities by agreement, we all said, okay, we're just not going to do this anymore. That part of human, the social order wouldn't exist. Um, I guess an example of this would be something like marriage equality. In a lot of countries, the the legal status, the legal recognition that was denied to same-sex couples is not a matter of necessarily like human uh, opinion in this case. It's we all agree on what, how we are bound by laws, which is a social construct. Sorry. And when the laws change, the law's view of, you know, they've stopped then not regarding those relationships as valid. And even if individuals don't like it, they can't, their dislike can't nullify the validity that others recognize and that the state recognizes. So it's human beings who decide what is and isn't valid or not. Um, in a legal sense, of course, individual opinions are a bit different. Anyway, social order is not biologically given or derived from any biological data in its empirical manifestations. This is for, for people who like um, the idea of natural hierarchies. This is a very threatening idea. Social order, needless to add, is also not given in humans' natural environment. There is nothing in our nature that forces us to organize um, our societies in any particular way. Now, there might be propensities, for instance, because um, the, uh, those like with certain hormones and um, phenotypes are physically more, um, uh, or you could say, can dominate. You're going to say a traditional, a sort of like a, a cis man's body has more likelihood of, of being big enough to, sub to subdue um, a cis woman's body at some point. I mean, that's not always the case. There's some women who can definitely kick some men's asses. But on the whole, uh, a physically more dominant form allows 
the use of violence to dominate and enforce hierarchies. And then those hierarchies that are initially established through violence become normalized as natural, and then other things in the social order start to try to provide something more legitimate than violence as a way to maintain that social order and those social hierarchies. So it might be religions teaching that men, uh, that cis men are naturally the leaders, um, even though that really has no place in, there's nothing in biology, there's nothing in nature that makes men natural leaders and women not natural leaders. Those are just social constructions. So our natural environments don't determine our social orders. Our social orders are um, chosen or not or enforced upon us or created by minds. Social order is not part of the natural the nature of things and it cannot be derived from the laws of nature. Social order exists only, 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 only as a product of human activity. If women are brainwashed uh, into submission because of their religion, they will reproduce those structures in society and they will try to pass them on, but they are not given to us by nature. They are given to us by other people. No other ontological status may be ascribed to it, and the it is social order, our social orders, without hopelessly obfuscating its empirical manifestations. Um, both in its genesis and in its existence in any instance of time, it continues to be a human product. While the social products of human existence... Um, oh, yeah, this is okay. So now, okay, so that's... Blah, 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 blah. That was an idea, right? So we're going to try to separate out these ideas because they tend to flow one into the other and sometimes you don't know where to draw the lines. I'm telling you, this is a place you can draw the line. While the social products of human externalization have a character of sui generis, I think that's how you say that, um, it's important to stress that externalizations um, are an anthropological necess necessity. So when they say the social products of our social orders are being it's sort of like, it looks like they appeared out of nowhere. It looks like they invented themselves. As we're born into a society, let's say, where if you're born into a fundamentalist Christian cult, where you are taught that um, that it is for, as a woman, your job to please God. How, the best way to please God is to serve your father and obey him and serve your husband and obey him. This is, it has the appearance of being um, an externalized thing, that norm that exists in the same way that gravity exists. It has a sort of externalization and a reality that um, the appearance of which, if you buy into that lie, then you submit to the order and you perpetuate it and you're part of it and, and there aren't any waves that are created. But if you question it and you start to pull it apart, that's, that's when the problems come. So generally our notions of social order appear a lot more externalized than they actually are. So um, human and, and then externalized, I guess I'm thinking in this way is it's not just uh, it's, its appearance in the way that it organizes our society seems separate from ourselves. But I think here what they're also meaning is like reading ahead, human beings, and, and this isn't a typo, human being as in to be, sein, in German. Um, human being must be ongoingly externalized. Uh, human being must ongoingly externalize itself in activity. That means the act of humans in their state of being is an externalized activities. So it's not being human, it's human being, <laughs> if that makes sense. The inherent, inherent instability of hum the human organism makes it imperative that humans provide a stable environment for our conduct. Um, and then, although no existing social order can be derived from biological data, the necessity for social order as such stems from our biological equipment. So. The way that we live in order to function in our world, the environments in which we find ourselves, uh, we need social orders and we establish social orders as human beings to help with our survival. 
Um, and uh, yeah, so there is a, a codependent relationship um, with uh, the social order and being as a result of the way that we are built and exist in the world. That's how I understand this section. Uh, I'm going to get to the last bit and then we're going to be done because that's going to be like a half hour. I'm going back. Like, I'm getting old. Uh, I need to like check my reading glasses. To understand the causes other than those posited by the biological constants for the emergence, how do it does, how does it emerge, maintenance, how is it perpetuated, and transmission across generations of a social order, one must undertake an analysis that eventuates in a theory of institutionalization. And here they don't mean being put in an institution. What they mean is the idea of um, institutions and institutions not being physical buildings like a police department or a city hall. Um, those buildings represent a far more encompassing and far more uh, ephemeral or in an immaterial social order, right? Um, institutionals, uh, institutions are actually not physical buildings. They are a set of rules and codes of conduct, expectations and agreements that structure human behavior in such a way to produce valid outcomes. Um, now, the validity of the outcomes don't does not depend on, let's say, it being democratic. Um, you can have valid outcomes in so far as um, people accept or, or take part in them and perpetuate them, uh, whether or not they actually think that they're like cool. So kings um, in the past, queens were able to enact certain legislation and other people regarded it as valid and followed it because they accepted the premises of the legitimacy and the power and the process. And then if those things are met, then an outcome is produced. And when those things are contested, either you have strife or you have civil war or you have revolution. And then you have to renegotiate some of those parts of what is valid and, and develop new institutions, new practices, get new people involved perhaps, and come to an agreement and then try to um, present that and get other people to reproduce those institutions so that they you have some stability over time. So that's what I mean by the theory of institutionalization not being put in an institution. It's establishing those practices to the point where people in a society agree to recognize them as valid. If they do, you know, A, B, and C, then outcomes X, Y, and Z will be followed. And that's about it. Um, yeah, that's all as far as we got for this one. The next one, we're going to talk about institutionalization and how we take practices that are routine or there were handed practices that are routine and they form the basis of the ways in which we find it acceptable or not to order our society. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff in here. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I, as I said, I'm a little bit on the, on the busy side now with a lot of things pulling my attention, but I'm, my goal is to at least once a week put out a section of a section. Uh, we're in section two now. We're in like chapter one of section two. And we're in section one of chapter one of section two. I think that's where we are. And I will try to keep up with this by doing regular videos. They might not be every single day kind of thing, like on the same day. Uh, I won't institutionalize a practice of having everything out on a Thursday uh, simply because my, my schedule can't handle that. Uh, I can't make that promise and keep it. So I'd rather under promise and over deliver than over promise and under deliver and disappoint people as perhaps people were when I had to move things from Sunday to Monday to Tuesday. All right. Um, yeah. If you have any interest in joining the discord group that is following this book and honestly, there's not a lot of conversation. I'm, it's mostly just me going, here are my notes or it's me going, I'm going to delay the video, <laughs> but you can DM me on Twitter at, at K Wint I E K Wint I E and I can give you a link to join the Discord group. Uh, you can try posting questions under the video, but honestly, I don't tend to look at the comments. Just going to be honest. And I think that's about it. Um, yeah, if you... Uh, that's it. Uh, I mean, I can pitch other stuff, but if you're here for the book, you're here for the book. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you for your time and attention. And thank you for um, your patience as I reschedule these. And until next time, I've been Christy. You have been awesome. We will see each other again very soon.